Shannon Baptist Church exists to make, mature, and multiply disciples of Jesus Christ one life at a time in the Midlands and beyond. Hi, everyone. I'm Dawn D. Mercer Plank. Welcome to True Confessions. Actually not. This is the Shannon Plus Podcast. I think our pastor got nervous just now. But I do have a true confession to make. There are people in my life for whom I pray regularly that he or she will become a Christian. But have I truly presented the gospel message to those friends of mine? So today we are looking at disciple making and how sharing our faith plays into that. Dr. Daniel Dickert is the senior pastor of Shannon Baptist, and I don't know that we want a podcast called True Confessions, <laughs> but, but this is Shannon Plus Podcast, and we are looking at disciple making. And Daniel, we have to first pray to God about those people, but we also need to take that next step in boldly and gently presenting the gospel message to them. So touch on how key it is to first pray for them. That's right, Donnie. In the last episode, we said that disciple-making is inviting people to Jesus and investing in their life. But there's a step we cannot overlook, and that's praying for lost people, what I would call pre-evangelism or getting ready to share with someone. And so we have to take intentional steps as a disciple-maker to pray for the lost. And that's where it begins. There has to be intentionality with daily praying for those who do not know the Lord. As we often say, before we can talk to people about God, we have to first talk to God about people. And I believe that the greatest soul winners, those who are passionate and faithful and consistent with sharing the good news that Jesus saves— If we're going to share faithfully, we have to pray faithfully. Or to say it another way, those who are more apt to pray for the lost are those who are more apt to share the gospel with the lost. And so as it comes to being a faithful disciple maker, I think the starting point is in what we would call pre-inviting people to Jesus, which is praying for them. We've got to pray for the lost before we talk to them about the gospel. Pray for them, and then also just be an example of what the gospel means. Um, you know, we, we don't know if Saint Francis of Assisi once said it, or you know, or who said it, but it is that it is a good idea to know that phrase: preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary. So it's a little poignant, but you have significant concerns over that concept. Yeah, you're right. We don't know if it was Francis of Assisi, whomever first said that. It's a popular phrase that has caught on, and many people think that if I just demonstrate with good deeds, people will know that there's something different about me. Now, and that's true, right? And it's true. We want to demonstrate the joy of Jesus, but we also have to declare the joy of Jesus. So demonstrate and declare. To say witness at all times, and if absolutely necessary use words would be like saying, give me a call, but if absolutely necessary, use numbers or (laughs) prepare me a meal. And if absolutely necessary, use food. No, I think the better way to say this is witness at all times. And because it is absolutely necessary, use words. Now, I fell trapped to this type of idea years ago, Dondi. I thought, well, if I just do good things for others and live a moral lifestyle, certainly people will know that it's Jesus that's made the difference in my life. But most people don't know Jesus. If they know anything about God, it's normally because of... uh, Folks tell, or perhaps that uh, they use God as a four letter expletive uh, mm-hmm. in vocabulary. They don't know about the God of the Bible and the hope that we have in Jesus. And so people need to hear. So while, yes, we pray for them, but we've got to take that next step and we've got to share Jesus with others. And I find, Donnie, the best way to share Jesus is through relationships building that relationship with someone, and then sharing the good news. I love it. You have, um, if I can quote you, you've said a caring hand often unlocks a cold heart. And there's a lot of truth to that. We can pray for them. We can witness and show our Jesus way of life. But we've got to build that relationship as a way to open up a Christ-centered conversation. I agree. We have to share the gospel by relationship and through relationship. But there is one caveat here. 
I've met some people that they've been making a friend for 40 years and they haven't shared the gospel with them yet. And to that, I would say, you're not being a great friend if it's taking you that amount of time to share the hope that's within you. So yes, build a friendship. I use what I call permission evangelism. Whenever I'm talking to someone, maybe it's a waiter or waitress at a restaurant, and I ask how I can pray for them. Mm. But then I ask, could I talk to you about spiritual matters, or could I share with you what God has done in my life? If that person says no, I operate off the biblical principle where Jesus said, don't cast your pearl before swine. That person may not be ready for that conversation, and we don't want to be known as shoving Jesus down someone's throat. That being said, if that heart has been prepared and God gives that door of opportunity, Paul talks about in Colossians these doors of opportunity. I ask someone if I can share, and if they say yes, then I want to be able to tell them in 30 seconds what God has done for me. When I craft my testimony, I try to give two words that describe my life before Christ, two words that describe my life when I met Christ, and then two words since I came to Christ. So my testimony would go something like this in a restaurant. Hi, my name is Daniel, and there was a time in my life where I was selfish and full of pride. But then I met Jesus, and I repented of my sins, and by faith received Him. And since then, God has given me hope, and He's given me joy. Do you have a similar story? And by asking the question, do you have a similar story, I get to hear, you know, Jesus says, from the outflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. I am trying to hear, do they have a similar story? Someone who has responded to the gospel, there will be the RBR element. That's an acronym them for repent, believe, and receive. If someone says, well, I've grown up being a Christian, well, I know that they haven't always been a Christian because there has to come a time in their life where they repent and turn to Jesus. Or someone might say, well, my good deeds will get me into heaven one day. Well, I know that's not true because Jesus himself said that wide is the gate that leads to destruction, narrow is the gate that leads to life everlasting. He says, if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God's raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So a good life doesn't get you into heaven. It's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you ask the question, do you have a similar story, you're trying to listen to see, does someone truly understand the gospel? And if they don't, then point them to the hope of Jesus. So sharing our faith does not have to be as complicated and scary as we like to think. It's share your testimony. People can argue with many things. They can't argue with the changed life. But then asking them, Do you have a similar story? So build that friendship, but get to the gospel as quickly as you can, because that's what being a good friend is, giving the hope of Jesus. Mm, I'm going to have to stop the car here. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to put it in reverse, and let's rewind a little. And here's why. I think that that was one of the best 30-second testimonies. I loved your idea. You know, we're often told to develop a three-minute or what they call an elevator testimony, the amount of time it takes to go up in an elevator with someone. But that's the first time I've heard it put that way. Your two words to describe your life. So I'm, we're going to repeat this. That's right. I, I, I want to, you know, give our listeners a chance to absorb this. Two words that describe your life before Christ. Correct. Then your two words, and that was selfishness and pride. That's correct. And that's, it, you can pick your own words, everyone, but <laughs> I think a lot of people could put those in too. And then the next was your two words that described your conversion. Correct. Which for me and for almost any Christian, you can use different words, but I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and I repented from my sins. So repentance and belief. Mm-hmm. You could say turn and trust, but you're talking about those two words that describe your response to the good news that you've heard. And then your last two words were hope and joy, and those described what Christ did in your life after receiving him into your life. That's exactly right. Six words that describe your testimony, and everyone has their own story. Mm -hmm. For you listening today, your story may be different from mine, but our stories connect. And you don't have to memorize the entire Bible to share your faith. Hey, it's great that if you have some scriptural references that can back up if people have questions. But I think that, Dondi, in an age of skepticism, 
so many Christians are hesitant to share their faith because they think, well, I don't have all the answers. Well, you may not have all the answers, but you can give your testimony, and then if someone has objections to the gospel, then you can simply say, I don't know the answer, but I can find the answer yes, for you. Yeah. And I think having humility and that mm-hmm. posture of, I don't know everything, but I will do my best to get you those mm-hmm. right answers. But people can argue with so many things, mm-hmm. but they cannot argue with your testimony. Your own personal testimony. And But I love how after those two words before, two words during the conversion, and two words after uh, describing your testimony, that you ended it with, do you have a similar story? So really what you're doing there is you're building that relationship and giving them the opportunity. So as we look at disciple making, yes, and reaching people, we pray for them, we witness, not just by our actions, showing our Jesus way of life, but then building that relationship and then boldly going to them and telling them about Jesus. So as we become disciple makers, I want to touch on some things. You you say that we really should intentionally share the gospel in word and deed. That's right. By words, I'm talking about declaring the gospel, but our witness also has to align with our lifestyle. I often say from the pulpit, Donna, you've heard this before, the tongue in our mouth and the tongue in our shoe must march in the same direction. Our actions and our attitudes align, our doctrines and our duties, our beliefs and our behaviors. There cannot be any incongruence between what we say about the hope of Jesus and the life that we live. Now, all of us know that if we are Christians, that we have fallen, we failed, we've messed up. That being said, that we cannot continue on the one hand to share the gospel and yet our life be a consistent contradiction. And so we're declaring in both word and deed the good news of what Jesus has done for. So that's what we're talking about in both word and deed. And we have to remember that we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. We're not doing this on our own, and we can use the word of God. You're right. So many Christians today, I believe they do not share Christ the way that they should because they rely on their own strength rather than relying on the strength of the Spirit of God within us. In fact, I would even go so far as to say as most churches do not rely on the Holy Spirit because we have what I commonly refer to as the four C's. We say, well, maybe we have a competent preacher or a capable worship leader. We have creative designs or a cool cut culture. But we would do well to remember that minimal resources drove the early church to godlike dependence. Without the Spirit's help in disciple making, we will make something, but it's not a disciple. Or if I could put it this way, Our words are hollow and empty without the Spirit's empowerment. So we need the Holy Spirit to help us in this area of disciple-making. And, you know, when you talk about a capable worship leader, I have to look over at Jonathan, who's in here. Uh, That's right. More (laughs) than capable. Hey, you're glad to know you're capable, Jonathan. No, we're very blessed. And then another area, it's, it's doing this is so that the sinner, somebody who doesn't know Jesus, can repent, believe, and receive Jesus. This is what I describe as RBR, repent, believe, receive, or what some have called as two T's, turn and trust. The gospel is the good news. It's a gift, but it's only a gift if one receives it. And many of you who have kids or you've opened a present before, a a present is great, but at some point that gift has to become yours. You have to willfully receive it. And Christ has died, I believe, for the sins of the entire world. 1 John 2 would say that. John 3, 16, for God so loved the whole world. However, faith has to be appropriated. There must come a time where we turn and we trust or we repent, believe, and receive. Now, we know, Dondi, that the scriptures say there in John 6, 44, that no one comes to the Father unless they're drawn by the Lord. And so we don't come to God on our own. This salvation is an act of God, not an act of man. But that being said, we have to, as sinners, Turn from our sin. That word repentance is a word that means that you do a 180. You are going in the direction of the world and the ways of the world, selfish, prideful, these words that I described, and yet we turn the other direction 
and we go towards God. In fact, I would say that repentance is the first words of the gospel. If you remember, Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So we repent, but then we believe. Belief is belief on, but not belief in. You know, when we think of belief, a lot of times we think of intellectual trusting, but it's to place your full weight on God. So your mind, your heart, your soul, your will, you are trusting God with everything. You are leaning on Him, so you repent, you believe, and and what do you believe? You believe that Jesus is God. You believe that apart from Him that salvation comes in no one else. You believe, as it says in John 14, 6, that He is the way, the truth, and the life. You believe that Jesus is the only way to the Father, and then you receive Jesus as Lord. And so it's it's not enough to just believe in Jesus as your Savior. You have to receive him as Lord. By Lord, I love what one person said. That means that God is taking up nude, renewed ownership in your life. You are marked by new management. He is in control. He is king of your life. As it's been said, in every heart there is a throne or a cross. Either Jesus is on the throne and you're dead to sin on the cross, or Jesus is on the cross. And if he's on the cross, you try to usurp him and be on the throne of your own life. So he must be on the throne. He must reign. That's what it means for him to be Lord. So we must repent, believe, and receive RBR, or the two T's, turn and trust. And once you do those things, then we would help somebody in us doing disciple-making explaining to them the importance of them being baptized and intentionally taught. That's right. Baptism is that outward expression of the inward change. Baptism doesn't save anyone. Baptism is just the symbol. It shows others. It's your public testimony that you are a follower of the Lord Jesus. And then you enter into discipleship. So what we're saying here is that the disciple maker moves from the task of sharing his or her faith and then moves to the point where no longer is the goal conversion. Now the goal is maturation. The goal is spiritual maturity. We want to see those who are babes in Christ, kids in Christ, to become fully grown disciples. And then they'd be accountable in having relationships, you know, not just... uh relationship I mean it's really your to whom are you accountable at that point yeah there are two questions every christian must ask to whom am i accountable and for whom am i accountable you need accountability but let me just stop right there donnie and quickly say accountability is not enough i've seen those in ministry who had great accountability groups and you see that they fall from ministry, they're no longer in ministry, well, there's something else called desires. And so the defense is accountability, but the offense is that we need to be renewed by the Word of God so that those evil desires that James talks about, that we don't succumb to sin. So we need offense and defense. We need both the accountability, but also to be renewed by the Word of God Every Christian needs a Paul, a Timothy, and a Barnabas. That Paul's the person who's investing in you. That Timothy is someone that you're investing in. And we all need the Barnabases, the encouragers who build us up and not tear us down. And that just helps us live an obedient life to Christ, both devotionally and missionally. Yeah, what I mean by that, devotionally and missionally, you know, a lot of Christians will pray and, and read their Bible and they say, well, I'm being a disciple or a disciple maker. And that's only being half of a disciple, because if you know Jesus, you're going to share him with others. We know God, and we make him known. And I find that many Christians today, Donnie, live half-obedient lives because they're in the Word, they're praying great. We commend that, we applaud that, but eventually, we've got to got to tell others about Jesus So we spend time with the Lord, we pray unto Him, but the joy of the Lord oozes out of us, and then when God gives us opportunities, we share Him with others. Ah, that's awesome. So we're going to continue, everyone, this topic next week as we look at the stages of disciple-making. Of course, we all start out as babies, and then we become toddlers, then children, then young adults, and then parents. 
in the Christian world. So if you are still hanging out at the kiddie pool in your spiritual walk, Daniel is going to help you move off the playground and onto the world stage, a place where the Lord is waiting with a lot of opportunities for you. Thanks, everyone, for listening to Shannon Plus Podcast. I'm Dawn D. Mercer Plank. And I'm Daniel Dickard, Senior Pastor, Shannon Baptist Church, signing off. We'll see you next week.